<laughs> some folks, <laughs> some folks think think things has to be done exactly the same. I don't know what it was, but something came over here a minute ago. Said to get up there and start talking, and so I will. I will. Turn to Matthew twenty four. Let me say this tonight. This is probably going to be a very important message. Matthew chapter twenty four. Matthew chapter number 24 and verse number 36. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Father, I pray that you'd anoint your word as it goes forth now. Bless the folk with it. Give us understanding and instruction from the scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Now, you know, this is 2017. I was born 1946. So I'll be 71 years old in September. That means I've seen a few things. I've been pastoring a church for 41 years. Being a pastor of a local New Testament uh, Bible-believing church, I have witnessed a lot of things come down the pike. I've seen a lot in 41 years. If I could only remember all of the things that I've seen, it would be a profound thing. But... Tonight, I want to give this scripture right here. I want you to take it to your heart because this is important. No man knows the hour. This tells me immediately that when someone begins to set a date, they're wrong. It's not necessarily that the date is wrong. I would that he came back before I'm done tonight. I mean, that's my attitude toward the second coming of Christ. The rapture of the church. Come right now. Even so come. As the apostle John said, so come Lord Jesus come. Yes, amen. But we don't know. We don't know. And I believe that a lot of damage has been done to the body of Christ by people who have set dates down through the years. For example, in the book of Acts, when they're talking about the Jews and the false messiahs, they name a bunch of them. You remember reading that in the book of Acts? Did Bar Kokhba, does that ring a bell for you? 130-something A.D., he rose up against the Romans, and literally they struck coins in his name. They had his edifice on the coin. And, uh, and, and Bar Kokhba was supposed to be the great deliverer of Israel from Roman bondage. He didn't do it. What happened with Bar Kokhba was that he brought the wrath of Rome down on Israel. They changed the name of Jerusalem to Aaliyah Capitolina. They put a Cardo Maximus down the center of the city. And they crucified every Jew they could find all over the place. And so what they tried to do is to drive the Jewish faith completely out of the Holy Land. And what happened in 130, I think it was 135, 136 uh, A.D., that was, the, that was the real kick in getting rid of the Jewish people from the Holy Land. And for 2,000 years they've suffered greatly at the hands of Bar Kokhba, a false messiah. People today want to see the Lord come back. People today are anticipating the second coming of the Lord. People today get excited about that. And we've got people that are writing books, making movies, documentaries, all kinds of material is out there and there is no end to it. It keeps coming in waves. This past week I spent an hour listening to a documentary about September the 23rd. That's coming up shortly. I'll deal with that later. But first of all, let me talk about a few things that have failed in the past. Did you know that Christopher Columbus set a date for the second coming of Christ? Christopher Columbus did. The date that he set was 1656. How did he arrive at that date? He arrived at that date by figuring from the time of the, of the creation of mankind, 4000 B.C., until the flood, which was 1656 years later, Columbus reasoned, well then since the creation of man was 1656 years later before the flood came, then from the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ until the coming of the judgment or the flood in typology will be 1656 years. Do you know what happened in 1656? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing happened. There was a fellow by the name of uh, William Miller. Many of you have heard about him. Miller writes. He was in New York. as He decided 1818 that Christ would return in 1842. To 1844, people sold everything they had, went up on top of a mountain top. They gathered together for the second coming of Christ. And do you know what happened in 1844? Nothing. 
A lot of people were very disappointed. Some of them became so disillusioned that they never darkened a church door again the rest of their lives. Their faith was absolutely destroyed. So what did William Miller do about it? He just became the head of a church, that's all. Just continued on in the same vein that he was in. Another person named a Millerite here, his name was Francis Nicole. He made the Millerite date an invisible event of Christ's movement in heaven. So since nothing happened on this earth, this fellow says, well, it happened up in heaven and you couldn't see it take place. That's an easy way to get out. That's the way he explained it away. Charles Taz Russell, this is the fellow that started the Jehovah's Witnesses. He felt alone that he could interpret scripture and he invented a lot of new things, Tar Charles Russell did, and he set dates for when the world would end. One of them was 1914, 1918, 1920, 1925, and 1941. It didn't stop with him. After Russell was gone, the Jehovah's Witnesses continued to set dates. Of course, nothing happened. Harold Camping, how many's ever heard of him? Harold Camping owned a bunch of radio stations, and he set a date that the Lord would be coming back, and, he, and, uh, and the date that he set, of course, for the Lord to come back did not happen. Exactly as he said it would happen, it did not happen. So Harold Camping was absolutely wrong and incorrect. Here's where he made his first mistake. He made his first mistake by setting a date for the second coming of Christ. Drill that into your soul until it makes an indelible impression in your heart. No man knows the hour or the day. No man. They may be well-meaning. They, they may be sincere followers of the Lord. But no man knows. Now if he says, well now God has showed me. I've had a special vision. God's given me a revelation. And off they go with this stuff. And it does not happen. Because they are breaking the word of God. They are sinning to begin with. When they tell you they know when Christ is coming back. I don't care who they are. It's a sin. For somebody to get up and tell you that they know the Lord is going to come back tomorrow. Then you're a liar and a sinner. Because the Bible says no man, no, not even the angels in heaven. Do they know that? Now there's a long list on the internet. And the reason there is such a long list on the internet of failed prophecies is because the people who are not Christians, who do not love our Lord Jesus Christ, are looking for something like this so they can laugh you to scorn. You wouldn't believe how people think we are a bunch of nuts because we're out here, we're out here, we're out here giving dates to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, in the 70s, Moses David, formerly David Berg, founder of a religious Christian group, the Children of God, predicted that a comet would hit the earth probably in the mid-70s and destroy all life in the United States. Didn't happen. We have, a, have had a number of prophecies that relate to the alignment of the planets. When I first came to Temple in 1976, a preacher down in Chattanooga had been producing all kinds of DVDs and messages about the alignment of the planets, the alignment of the planets, the alignment of the planets. And so everybody was all excited about the early 80s, about this alignment of the planets, how that it was going to have such a profound effect upon the earth that it had to be related to the second coming of Christ. You know what happened? Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely zilch. Now down through the years, I've seen good Christian people get caught up in this stuff, and I've seen their faith falter because they have been caught up in the idea that the Lord is going to come back as it relates to some, some astrological, astronomical phenomenon. Something in the planets aligning. September the 23rd is approaching such a thing. 1987, the Harmonic Convergence planned for August the 16th, 17th, 1987. And several New Age events were to occur at that time. The second coming of the serpent god of peace. And the Hoppy Dance Awakening were two examples. Did it happen? No, it didn't happen. But they, planned, they, they said it would. 1988. I've got the book somewhere. 88 reasons why the rapture will take place in 1988. 
That book wasn't out very long. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way, but that worked out pretty good, didn't it? <laughs> 1988 didn't happen. But a lot of people got caught up in it. They got caught up with this, and they got carried away with it. And, of course, when it did not happen, their faith was left shipwreck. And, of course, the book sold a lot of copies, and somebody made some money. Because when you start selling books, then you start making money. In 1990s, 1992, David Koresh of the Branch Davidians. How many remember him? Waco, Texas. A group in Waco changed the name of their commune from Mount Carmel to Ranch Apocalypse because of his belief that the final all-encompassing battle of Armageddon mentioned in the Bible would start at the Branch Davidian compound. They had calculated that the end would occur in 1995. After a 51-day standoff, 1993, uh, 76 members died as a result of a deliberately set fire. And, of course, the Lord did not come back. Now, here's one of the more sinister. There are those people who, out of, the, out, of a, out of a believing heart, though deceived, are setting dates for the coming of the Lord. All right. That's one thing. But when somebody sets a date knowing that it's all a hoax and they're going to make money from it, that's an entirely different situation. Listen to this one. Lee Jang Rim started a church called Mission for the Coming Days. He was jailed for two years after embezzling $4.4 million from 10,000 of his cult members. He had used the money to buy bonds. Watch this. He used the money, he had used the money to buy bonds that would mature after the end of the world. Numerology was the basis for the date. Several camera shots that left ghostly images on pictures was thought to be a supernatural confirmation of the date. The cult looked forward to the second coming at 9 a.m. on this day. They believed Jesus would return through Sydney Harbor. They had their prayers and songs. At the fatal hour, there was a loud countdown of the final seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6... The leaders disappeared after an hour, hiding their faces from reporters. One reporter was punched. Some disappointed members committed suicide, probably because they gave all their worldly assets to Lee Jang Rim. Originally from Korea, Australia was the home base, which was abandoned and the phone disconnected for a non-payment of bill. That is the worst of the worst. Because these, these are the ones who profit from this kind of thing, and but they're still out there. They're still profiting from this. Michael Drosnan, author of The Bible Code, found a hidden message in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, that predicts that a comet will crash into the earth in 2012 and annihilate all life. In other words, an apocalypse is going to be brought down. Did that happen? No, it did not happen. How many of you know about the Mayan calendar, 2012? The Mayan calendar ended 2012. What happened? Nothing. But a lot of attention was, was, was brought to the fact that the Mayan calendar ended in such and such a date in 2012. Now here just in the last few years, the last few months, blood moons, book came out, big deal, pushed all over the country, pushed all over the world. Something profound is going to happen. Did it happen? No. Did it happen? No. Did a lot of people buy the book Blood Moons? Yes, they did. But nothing happened whatsoever. Just in the last few months, we've heard a lot about the Mandela effect. Have you noticed how sinister this is becoming? The Mandela effect is simply, to put it in simple terms, what you have printed in your Bible is not what was in there a few hundred years ago. It was not in the original text. And so what you have in there now is deceiving. So the Mandela effect tells you that you cannot trust your Bible. What are they doing? They're messing with your mind. They're messing with your mind big time. See what's happening? They, 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 they prognosticate the second advent. Doesn't happen. Now they are assaulting the Bible and it's affecting the lives of a lot of people. 
Just a few months ago, I was confronted by a woman out here in the foyer. Out of the clear blue, and I must confess that I've been at this a long time. And issues have arisen in the last few months. Issues have arisen that I'm not up on that much. And she, she came up to me out there in the foyer. You see now, Preacher Lawson, you need to believe in the flat earth. Now, let me say this about the people who believe, genuinely believe that the earth is flat. I believe that a lot of these people are good people. I believe they love the Lord. I really do. And I don't question that. Like I said in the message this morning, just because someone doesn't agree with me in eschatology, church policy and so forth, I'm not going to call them a heretic. I'm not going to call the people who believe in a flat earth heretics. I've spent a good bit of time since then. Watching documentaries, listening to these people, reading their material. I've had book after book after book that's been mailed to me about the flat earth. And I'm going to tell you tonight, I have yet to read or hear or see anything that causes me to move from my belief that this earth is a globe. It's a globe out here in space. Now, they go back to Copernicus. They say that the church at one time believed the earth was flat and that when Copernicus came in and he changed it from a, from a, from a geocentric to a heliocentric or from a heliocentric to a geocentric. And by doing that, then the, then the focus is no longer on the fact that the earth is the foundation of the Lord and it has foundations and all that they preach about that. But now they, have, they say that he has people looking up into the skies and they weave this web as if to say, that if you don't believe in a flat earth, that you are being deceived by demons and you're ready to be deceived by the Antichrist when he shows up. And it gets pretty bad. And some are worse than others. Yesterday, listen carefully to what I'm saying now. I'm no expert on these people. But yesterday, I listened to a documentary. I've put some effort into this by one of their gurus. In other words, one of their teachers, he seems to be well read in his position on a flat earth. Here's what he said. He warned in his video, in his documentary, how that a lot of his flat earth brethren are now beginning to get involved in esoteric alien things. In plainer words, they're starting to be plugged into a spirit world they don't need to be plugged into. I've tried my best in Sunday school, time and time and time and time and time again, to explain to you how that the occult world does not see this world like you do. That there is an absolute difference in what they see and what you see, and there's an issue of semantics. When they say God, they're not saying God as I say God. There's an entirely different paradigm with these people. But it was quite revealing, quite telling for one of their own teachers to come out and say, many of you people in the flat earth, you better start watching what you're doing because you're getting involved, to paraphrase him, in the occult. And I thought to myself, why is that? Nowhere in this Bible was I ever led into the occult. Nowhere did the Holy Ghost ever lead me into the occult. No, quite the difference. Far from it. He built a wall inside my soul. Red flags began to pop up all over the place. Well, I'm doing research into this stuff. And believe me, folks, I get in deep. I get in, in some places pretty dense. I've read stuff that I would never give out from this pulpit. There's no way I would tell you what I've read. No way. I give you certain things. That I, that I think this is as far as I can go. When I say that a 90-year-old, 90-pound woman, 90-pound woman can pick up a 200-pound man and throw him across a room like you would a rag doll, you think about that. That's a real world. I respect that world. I respect the power that Satan has. I respect his ability to deceive. This is not a game. It's not a joke. But you watch these people that are in this flat earth movement. I thought to myself, no, wait a minute. I've been preaching God's word now for decades. Been preaching in revivals and tent meetings and all over the place. And now why is it all of a sudden, after all of these years in the ministry, 
that this becomes a big issue where this is all important and all encompassing that it makes all the difference in the world whether I believe in a flat earth or not and something started flying up inside me red flags begin to pop up I've noticed some of these people are obsessed with it that's all they can think about is the flat earth folks have you ever noticed that I was ever obsessed with a global earth <laughs> do you know why it ain't that important it's just a ball out here that's this footstool. <laughs> a floating graveyard in the sky. It's not about the earth. It's about Christ and your sins and salvation. But to these people, they are obsessed. That's not all of them. But many of them, it's all they think about. And they get so obsessed with it that if you disagree with them, they condemn you in a heartbeat. We got a problem. There's a spirit showing up here. And this guru talking on his, on his uh, YouTube cha channel yesterday, it's very telling about what's going on with the flat earth. So I'll say that to you with all the love that I know how to say it. Now, September the 23rd is coming up. And I spent a good bit of time trying to figure out exactly what it is they believe about September the 23rd. You say, well, now, is this important? It's important to a lot of people. September the 23rd is a date when certain planets will be aligned in the constellation Virgo. It has been 7,000 years since these very planets have been aligned in the constellation Virgo. 2,000 years ago, 2,000, at 3 B.C., a number of these planets were aligned in the constellation Virgo, the Virgin, and, there, and the man who was doing the documentary said, that is the date when Christ was born. What date was that? 9-11-3 B.C. So he brings it from 9-11-3 B.C. down to 9-11 when it happened here in this country in the two towers going down in Washington, in, in, in New York City. And they start weaving this web about these planets they are appearing, and they connect that with Revelation chapter number 12, with a woman and the 12 stars. You say, well now, what's wrong with that, preacher? Here's the problem. You're listen, if you want to interpret the Bible, and, and, and I listened to the man, and some of the things that he said were very true scripturally, but some of the titles and designations and connections that he made with the planets are completely arbitrary. He pulled them out of the sky and connected them to the planets. Completely arbitrary. Like Mars, for example, and Jupiter and all these other things. They're arbitrary. In other words, they're his take on it. They're his interpretation to it. And if that's true with him, why would it not be true with another one over here or another one here? In plainer words, if the Bible does not support it, folks, it's hanging out here on nothing. So what, is, what does September the 23rd portend then, preacher? Is the Lord going to come back September the 23rd? Well, I hope He comes back September the 22nd. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I hope He comes back before the sun goes down here. You know, I'm not mad because somebody's looking for the Lord to come back in September the 23rd. Hallelujah. But I am not placing my faith in anybody picking a date, setting a date or a time for the second coming of Christ. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And you say, well, you'd be disappointed then if the Lord doesn't come back in September the 23rd. No, because I'm not appointed to begin with. I don't buy into it. I will be just as disappointed tomorrow as I will be the 23rd of September. Every day the Lord does not come back is a day of disappointment for me. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. I want Him to come. With all of my heart and all of my soul, the only hope for this world is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why He's called the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's all that mean then, preacher? It means that all of these things, I view them in peripherals. They're peripherals. There are people out here that mean well, they may have gotten a hold of a little bit of truth, and they mix it up, and they, and they present it the way they want to. Some of these people out here are making money on this. It's a money thing. That's all they're interested in is making money. 
There's a lot of people out here that are genuine, born-again believers, sincere as they can be, and they get caught into this stuff, and, and they don't know what to do. And then when it doesn't happen, then they're out here, they're just, they're just loose. They don't know what to go. Their foundation has been destroyed. So this is why that I give out a message like I did tonight and say that it's so important. Remember this. No man knows the day. No man knows the hour. No man knows this. The Lord Jesus said that. Let's read it again, what he said. In Matthew chapter number 24. And verse number 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. That's good enough for me. He may not come in my lifetime. He may not come in my lifetime. He may not come in your lifetime. The one that we serve, the day, of the, Lord, the day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. He that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleep. God is eternal from everlasting to everlasting. Our little short brevity of a life here on this earth is just here today and we're gone tomorrow. We don't last any time. It is a wonderful thought to think that during our lifetime, the Lord is going to come back and the heavens are going to roll back like a scroll and He's going to catch us up to meet Him in the cloud. Who wouldn't have that blessed hope? What, a, what, what more of a wonderful thing that could happen to any of us is for the, hear the trump of God when the great day of the Jubilee trumpet sounds. The trump of God when the captive is made free, when the jails are opened, when the land returns to its original owner, when all these things happen at the second advent of Christ. Who wouldn't be looking forward to that? But it may not happen in our little short lifetimes. But let me tell you what's going to happen. Let me tell you what nobody can change. In 1973, God came to me. And when He came to me in 1973, He changed me. God moved into my life. There's no question about that. There is no way in the world that somebody as big as God can move into your life and you not know it. No way. No way. So don't ever let anybody cast doubt in your mind about that new birth, about being born again, about being saved by the grace of God. That's what changed me. There's no doubt in my mind about His faithfulness to His people. He's never left me nor forsaken me. He's been to me in ways, communicated with me in ways that I never imagined possible. We communicate to each other by speech. I'm speaking to you right now. All right? Satan can speak to you. But did you know that God can communicate to you and you not even know when he communicated, but one day you'll turn around and say to yourself, God said something to me. Something has begun to change. I see things differently. That's God communicating to you, and you didn't even know how He did it. That's the difference in the spirit world and this world of flesh. So God has been faithful to me. God will never fail me, and He won't fail you. And let me tell you something. If we go the way of all the earth, the way, of the, way the rest of them have gone before us, we're not any better than them. Not, a one, not one bit better than them. And let me tell you something to remind you tonight. When, you know the man up there in Minnesota who went over there and shook England and he shook the, the states. He, they say he was a shoe salesman when he got saved. His name was D.L. Moody. Dwight Lyman Moody. And when Dwight Lyman Moody left this world, he rose up in his bed and he looked out into the room. He said, is this it? He said, is this what I've been waiting for? He said, look at this. He said, the heavens are opened. They're coming into the room. It's full of light. It's full of God. Hallelujah. He was shouting. He was praising God as he left that room and was carried out into the presence of the Lord. The story is told about a little girl. And she came down time to die to leave this world. Her daddy was in the room with her. She said, I love you, Daddy. And Daddy said, oh, honey, I love you so much. I love you. I wish I could just keep you with me. She said, Daddy, the Lord's going to come and get me. He's going to come and get me. And Daddy said, I know that. I know you belong to the Lord. But I just want you to know how much I love you, and I'm going to miss you when you're gone. You're my little girl. You're precious to me. He said he saw this dark thing come through the window. He said he saw it hover down over his little girl. He couldn't believe what was happening when this thing came down over that little girl. 
then he saw this light being come through the window. And that light being took that dark thing and he knocked it out of the way. And he reached down and he picked up that little girl. And I guess she gave him one last smile. Said, I love you, Daddy. And carried her off into the presence of the Lord. That's what happens when a saint leaves. Satan will fight for your soul to the very last breath you draw. But if you're born again by the grace of God, he can't touch you. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your word tonight, Lord. I pray for all my brothers and my sisters out there, Lord. Some of them believe in flat earth. Some of them bought the blood moons. Some of them believe in this Mandela effect. Some of them are tied up with September the 23rd, head over heels into it. So excited about something that may never happen. Father, I pray for every one of them. I love all of them, Lord. I have no, I have no, I have no vindictiveness against any soul out there. I love all of them, Father. And then, Heavenly Father, may September the 24th, when this doesn't happen, may September the 24th be a day of rejoicing because Christ is still seated at the right hand of the Father. He still reigns, and He's coming as King of kings and Lord of lords. And He'll come when you tell Him to come. And the kingdom will come when you tell Him to come. And nothing's going to stay that. Nothing's going to, nothing's going to stop it. But no man knows the day or the hour until that happens. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Van Caldwell. There you are. You can come back up here now.